haven't joined us yet, I'm Sunshine Menezes, Executive Director of Metcalf Institute at URI, and we are glad that you have made time to join us today to learn some really valuable skills and insights. Um, this is um, the winter intensive we do every January before classes start so that we, uh, so that you, our intended audience of senior level undergraduates and graduate students and postdocs can um, make sure to make time for these professional development trainings outside of the craziness of the class period. Of course, we hadn't accounted for the fact that everything would be crazy all the time when we first came up with this schedule. So um, we're really glad that you're here. So this session will go from nine to 11.45 today and we'll have a short break in there too. So um, don't feel that you're gonna be on Zoom for two hours and 45 minutes straight. Um, the, uh, a little bit before I introduce our speakers, this is offered as part of a suite of trainings in the career development program, but you can also sign up for a CDP certificate. So this is um, a, a paper certificate. It's not, it doesn't go on your transcript, but that means that regardless of what institution you're at, you can actually include this on your CV or your resume, and it's not a, a suite of trainings that most people at, at your career stages can add to their CVs, so it's a big deal. Um, to get the certificate, it's actually super easy. You need to participate in five required training topics and then choose three electives from a very, very long list of options. And if there were a course that or a training somewhere um, not offered by Metcalf, but offered by another institution or offered even elsewhere in the country, that you felt was really appropriate for the certificate, you would just need to get in touch with us and ask uh, if that would be suitable and we'd, we'd let you know. You can do this over any time frame, and uh, you must register to be part of the certificate. So you can find out all about this by going to metcalfinstitute.org backslash career development. All the details are there and you can register for the certificate. So please do that. And then I, I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers today, Dr. Christopher Lane, a professor in biological science, or sorry, in cell and molecular biology at University of Rhode Island. And um, Chris studies uh, algal genomic evolution and uses a variety of molecular techniques to do that. And Jeff Bothan, Dr. Jeff Bothan, who is a professor in chemical engineering at URI and also the PI of the Rhode Island CAIM grant that supports this whole thing. So we're glad that he could join us today too. Jeff's lab looks at, um, uses nanotechnology to explore new pharmaceutical systems and um, also to look at harmful pollutants in the environment. So we thought it would be really great to have them both here today. Chris is gonna lead this conversation, but Jeff is here because his engineering perspective in um, working on proposal writing is going to be a little bit different from Chris's experience um, because they typically would submit their proposals to different programs at NSF. With that, um, I, oh, one more thing I'll note, we are um, live captioning this program via otter.ai. So you can see the little red button up on the top left of your screen, your Zoom screen. If you wanna click on the transcript, um, just, or if you wanna see the transcript, just go there. And we're also recording this session and we'll post it on our YouTube channel for those of you who've attended today. All right, with that, I will hand it over to Chris and Jeff and apologize because I have to leave a little early today. So I'll be here for a while and then uh, the rest of the Metcalf team will guide us the rest of the way. Great, thanks so much. Um, I'm glad to have uh, Jeff here as well, just because again, different different perspective. And I see a bunch of graduate students from uh, my bio 500 class. So I don't want there to be too much overlap with, uh, with that. Um, uh, that class. So Jeff's perspective, I think will be really helpful there. Um, okay, so today, uh, I kind of wanted just to dig into how proposals um, work for NSF. Uh, there's a couple different pieces of that puzzle, I'm gonna essentially compress a lot of what um, I deal with in my uh, BS uh, 501 class into this short, um, short time frame. Um, so I wanted to just start off, um, I'm going to 
try and uh, share my screen a bunch here if I can. Okay. Uh, make sure I get the right one. There we go. Okay. Um, so the the landing page for NSF um, is pretty straightforward, and unlike a lot of other funding agencies, where um, it's pretty challenging, I think, to dig and find exactly what you're looking for. Uh, NSF is pretty straightforward. There is uh, essentially, if you ignore this sort of rolling news bar, there's a couple pieces up at the top here, and this is where you can get to everything quite quickly. Um, there's uh, re research areas here uh, where you can essentially get to all of the different directorates of um, of NSF. Uh, I'm going to dig into biological science first and we can talk a little bit about engineering if Jeff is, uh, wants to do that. Um, but where you really need to um, check first and foremost is under this funding bar, um, this uh, proposal and awards policies and procedures guide. This is their updated uh, guide that applies to all funding uh, that goes through NSF. And this, this, out, this document outlines um, everything that is expected of um, people submitting a grant proposal. And I've got that here. Um, it, it gets updated about uh, once, at least once a year, sometimes a bit more. And uh, it's really important that you find this document and take a look at it um, before you start writing a proposal because uh, of this front page right here. So there's um, the very beginning of this document is the, the changes that have occurred since the last document. Um, and this is quite important because sometimes NSF makes changes that really, really fundamentally alter how you submit a proposal. Um, in this case, they've actually done two things. They've changed um, the biosketch format. So now you actually have to use um, a very specific format for your biosketch which um, so you can't just reuse one you've had before. Uh, they've also uh, modified their current and pending format. Um, current and pending is a, uh, a portion of the proposal where you uh, basically divulge your current funding that you have in hand and any um, applications you've already submitted. Um, and I just, by the way, if anyone has questions along the way, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, uh, I think there's a raise hand function in this. Um, in addition, or you can just um, uh, just give me a holler if the raise hand function, if I'm not seeing it. Uh, with the shared screen, it's a little bit challenging to find the shared screen function. Uh, sorry, the um, raise hand function. Um, OK, so essentially everything that is involved in the changes happens here. Um, and you can get a quick outline of all of that. Um, relatively quickly, they summarize everything that's been changed from the previous version. Now, if you if you're not familiar with the previous version, obviously these changes it's a little hard to um, notice a change to something if you're not familiar with the old document. But what this document essentially does is run through every type of proposal, how it's submitted, um, and what the expectations are. Um, full proposals are the main sort of bread and butter of um, NSF. There's a couple of different types of full proposals, but uh, for this particular um, discussion, I think we're going to just sort of focus on the core proposals. Um, Jeff, I don't know if there's any other types of proposals that are common for, um, for engineering um, other than basically core proposals. I can quickly talk about what rapid and eager proposals are, but um, I don't know if there's the ones from engineering. Yeah, you know, Chris, um, uh, thanks for letting me join you here today. <laughs> it's good to see you. It's been a while. Yeah. Good to see everybody on the call, too. I think this is great. Um, it's such a kind of an important and a cool, cool topic. It's one of my favorite things to do as part of my job is write proposals, believe it or not. Um, you know, that's where you let your creativity flow and, you know, both the end, your design, too, and creating figures and creating a compelling story. So, um, you know, to your question, Chris, I think, yeah, when, when the time, you know, when it when it comes up, I'll, I may raise something about eager, for instance, you know, um, COVID is a good example where engineering, uh, the engineering directorate and, and their programs funded quite a bit of, you know, uh, PPE mask development, um, et cetera. So we, we I, I'm certainly uh, when, when, when there's a spot where it makes sense, I'll, I'll chime in and, and sure. add to it. 
Sure. Well, why don't, uh, I think we can quickly just talk about the those sort of non, uh, I guess I would call them non-traditional type of proposals, but they're maybe not, they're actually sure. becoming a bit more, um, uh, yeah, mainstream at the moment. Sure. Um, yeah, so there, there's a couple sort of main types. Um, there's a rapid proposal and an eager proposal. Um, the, of course, NSF loves acronyms, the federal government does in general. So those both stand for something, although I can't tell you offhand exactly what they stand for. Um, but a rapid proposal is essentially um, a proposal that is, um, uh, doesn't necessarily go through a full peer review. It gets reviewed by program officers. Um, and it's a smaller proposal. Uh, the budget limit on that, I think is, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, it's 150, I think it's 150,000. I, that, that sounds about right. They may have specific cases for yeah. certain types of natural disasters or, you know, pandemics. Right. But rapid proposals are proposals that are really focused on reacting to a particular event. So um, if a, uh, like a natural disaster comes through to a study site that you've worked on in the past, and there's an urgent need to, um, you know, get back there and look at the, how the environment is reacting to that natural disaster, those types of proposals. So they're, they, they are geared towards being fast turnaround, um, not a huge amount of money, but for a very, very specific event that has occurred. Um, eager proposals are a little bit different. And Jeff, you wanna to touch on those? That'd be great. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, so I, <clears throat> just following up on the rapid proposal. So just to give you an example, um, the uh, BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there was a, a special uh, rapid call for proposals through NSF and other funding agencies. And essentially, you know, you apply your science, your engineering knowledge um, to try to help decision making, right? You need the, you know, the, the agencies need some quick answers. The scientific community needs quick answers, you know, and how can you provide that information? Um, and and that's, that's, a, that's a pretty important funding mechanism. The eager proposals, so, so these proposals also may or may not undergo a full NSF review, a panel review. Often they don't. It's program managers and maybe an ad hoc review by mail or something. Um, so eager proposals are more closely aligned with the kind of a regular, I've got a great idea in a really important emerging topic. Um, and uh, what eager allows program officers to do, you know, may, maybe a, a new research field is emerging, but there's not quite enough there to support, uh, you know, the background literature, um, but it looks like it's really promising and exciting. It's kind of a high risk idea that you have. You can actually email a program officer at NSF and say, hey, I got this great idea. And, uh, you know, if there's any Perhaps uh, Chris will touch upon this, but if there's any questions on, you know, kind of the right way to contact a program officer, you know, uh, we could certainly have that discussion too. Um, but you pitch this idea, and you know, and, and you say, hey, would, would you would you entertain an eager proposal? I got this great idea. We don't have a lot of preliminary data for it. It's a new emerging area. Um, would you consider supporting it? And those are often, they're they're a little bit smaller too. They're typically two year, one or two years. Uh, which allows a research group to to move kind of quickly uh, to make some you know initial discoveries, and they're about a hundred thousand dollars per year. Uh, it really depends on the nature of the request. I, I think program officers have some flexibility into um, you know how long and at what level they can fund a project. Um, yeah, and when I get into the directorates, we can talk a little bit about the types of program officers and, and how to kind of find those people. Um, okay, so typically those proposals, the rapid and the eager proposals, um, they need to be at least a niche, uh, think of it as almost a pre-submission inquiry to a program officer. You need to uh, contact them with uh, at least the framework of your idea uh, typically, you would uh, include a few aims of the proposal and a little bit of explanation um, just to get them uh, to kind of green light a, uh, a proposal from you. Those are uh, shorter proposals. They're not the typical 15 page proposals that um, are uh, the full proposals. And, um, so, and they have some very specific guidelines. Um, 
all of which you can you can find here. Um, I don't think it's probably worth digging too deep into the the nitty gritty of those different proposals, um, but uh, the guidelines for them are are in this document as well. Um, okay, so this, uh, as I was saying, this document pretty much provides um, very detailed instructions of all the different um, types of documents that you need to prepare. Um, everyone sort of thinks that, okay, you, you write up the proposal and, you know, that takes a pretty significant amount of time and then, okay, you just submit that. But in fact, there's actually a whole bunch of other documents that, um, that are important parts of this proposal. It's not just the, the main proposal itself. There's um, at least a half dozen other documents that have to be prepared. Um, and many of which uh, are, um, can be sort of moving targets. Um, for instance, the postdoc mentoring plan. Um, if you have a postdoc that you've uh, put on, uh, if you budget it for a postdoc, for instance, in this proposal, there needs to be a detailed mentoring plan for how that postdoc uh, will be mentored uh, from a career perspective, um, from a networking perspective, a variety of different things. Um, and that that's a somewhat new, it's about, I don't know, an eight year old uh, initiative. And uh, initially that postdoc mentoring plan you know, like all new documents, started out um, with a certain sort of set of expectations, but like everything else, those expectations have ramped up as we got more and more examples of, of good mentoring uh, plans. And so if you um, are writing a proposal that includes some of these documents, it can be really helpful to get examples from people who have been doing it for a while. Um, the data management plan would be another one. Um, a data management plan uh, is required for any time that essentially you're producing data that might be usable from someone else. So in my field, a lot of that includes bioinformatic data. Um, so a lot of uh, sequence data or, um, uh, or any sort of, um, uh, yeah, DNA sequence data that comes from uh, transcriptome data, any of that kind of stuff that comes uh, how are you going to manage that? And that doesn't just mean how are you going to make it available, but what's the time frame of how quickly it's going to be available for people? Um, what formats will it be available in? How is it going to be archived uh, before it's publicly available? All these types of things. Um, and so all of these are, are important sort of pieces of the puzzle of, this, um, of these proposals. And I'll, I'll show an example in a little bit. Um, are there other ones that are important in engineering that I'm not thinking of? Not really okay. All right. Um, so yeah, so this, uh, again, this is a, a very um, extensive document that includes really detailed instructions. Um, but when it comes to writing the proposal, there's two very, it's sort of two fundamental pieces of it. There's the, um, the intellectual merit, which is the sort of science behind it. And then there's the broader impacts. Um, now, technically, the broader impacts and intellectual merit, um, NSF will say they they're, tend to be weighted equally. I, I've never quite found that to be entirely true. Um, the intellectual merit has always sort of been what carries proposal, but um, a poor broader impact section can absolutely sink a proposal, um, unquestionably. <clears throat> now, what is broader impacts? Um, that's not just saying, okay, well, we're gonna do this, and this is the impact it will have on society. While that's important, um, that's not exactly what they're looking for when it comes to broader impacts. Um, broader impacts tend to be activities where uh, you can almost think of them as outreach activities often. Um, they are activities that uh, NSF expects you to take uh, science to the general public. Um, and so when people list things like, well, we're going to go talk at a conference or uh, we're going to, you know, put up a website, things like some of these sort of passive things or things sort of preaching to the choir, um, you're going to incorporate some of the research topics in your teaching in undergrad. While that's all fine, that's not going to meet the bar in terms of uh, a broader impact section. Um, Chris, can I jump in here for a second? Absolutely. 
So this is the broader impact section is very much my wheelhouse and Metcalf's wheelhouse because we work with a lot of PIs to um, expand their broader impacts. Um, and there's a couple of things that I wanted to say here. One is that this, like Chris, so first of all, as Chris said, it's really important to understand what NSF is trying to achieve with this section. It is truly about societal impact. It is well beyond your lab, even your institution. This is about how you're making the world better, um, uh, which can be all kinds of things, right? Um, with the work that you're doing and with the um, additional public engagement piece that you're adding in, whatever that might be. Um, also, it's really important to distinguish between broader impacts and broadening participation. So broadening participation is something that NSF is, is um, at least on paper, very committed to. Um, and uh, I obviously have lots of feelings about this, but the idea there is that broadening participation means um, engaging underrepresented groups in the practice of science and engineering and or in the, the broader impacts related to the research that you're doing. Broadening participation and broader impacts are not the same thing. And often, I can tell you this from reviewing proposals, um, as well as having discussions with, with other PIs, often those things are conflated. So it's really important to, to realize that you can broaden participation within your broader impacts component, but broadening participation and broader impacts are not the same thing. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that if that wasn't clear, but it's just a, a little like pet peeve of mine that I wanted to add. Absolutely. No, I, I agree with that entirely. Um, and yeah, so broader impacts can be uh, a, a bit of a tricky thing to kind of get your head around uh, right off the bat um, early on when you're, you're starting to write proposals. Um, and what I often encourage people to do um, is to try and lean on some things that are already happening at your institution. So you certainly uh, can, and many people do try and sort of reinvent a wheel, um, but often there are established um, broader impact type um, uh, activities happening at the university that you can help with, that you can engage with, that you can um, work through that um, will just make it a lot easier to uh, pull off a broader impact section. Um, I often see uh, in proposals people say, well, I'm going to, you know, do um, um, a couple classes at a school, but there's no indication that that school has been contacted. And to be honest, uh, the school districts are really tough to break into and they already have a very jam-packed schedule in terms of what kind of what material they need to cover for state testing for all these types of things and to just wander in and be like hey i'm gonna teach for a couple of days that doesn't fly um so in unless you actually have a an established relationship with a school district with a particular school um and can demonstrate that in some way that that type of thing again tends to be sort of empty, um, you know, empty language in a broader impact section. Uh, the two things that, um, and so I'm, I'm focusing on broader impacts for a second because then we're gonna kind of go to proposal land in a couple minutes here, but. Hey, Chris. Yeah. So uh, I, was gonna, I was gonna comment on um, kind of the balance between intellectual merit and broader impacts, but I can hold off if you're gonna get more into. No, go for it. We'll, I'll, I'll do okay, it. okay. Um, so, so I've been on, uh, like Chris and, and probably Sunshine too, I've been on quite a few NSF panels, right? You know, and, and you think about the intent of this. So what's the intent of this workshop today, right? It's, it's to familiarize you up and coming kind of next generation of scientists and academic leaders and industry, you know, uh, R&D leaders, um, you know, how to write these proposals, essentially how to put together a compelling argument to support your work. And I've been on a lot of panels, and typically, I, typically the 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 broader the, the proposals that have weak broader impacts generally also tend to have weak some weak components in intellectual merit. Um, but there's a lot of proposals that the intellectual merit is strong. I mean, it's a phenomenal idea, 
but the broader impact section comes across as just kind of an add on. You know, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. You know, we're, we're um, I think you definitely want to partner with existing, uh, with existing groups, with existing uh, programs, because you have to think about your capacity to do the work. Something that always comes up on a review panel is okay, we have a junior faculty member. And you know they, they're proposing this great idea, but they're also proposing to develop two classes and a new outreach program, you know, and a, a community speaking series. And the panel will always sit there and say, "Well, hold on a minute. You know, how many hours are in the day? You know, I remember when I was a junior faculty, I could hardly, you know, come up for a breath, let alone create three new courses. So it has to be creative and credible, and you have to lean on those existing programs." that are out there. But my, you know, at this stage, I think my, my, my little tip for you would be the proposals that win, number one, really well organized and well written, no grammatical mistakes, nice figures, et cetera. But that goes without saying, pay attention to that broader impacts. Cause usually what puts that proposal over the edge, what distinguishes the ones that get funded from the ones that don't, which, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20% get funded depending on the program is the broader impacts I find. You know, because there's people have a lot of great research ideas, you know, but but not a lot of people have a lot of great broader impact ideas or, or, or maybe better yet know how to participate and are willing to be creative and and contribute to to broader impacts. So and I'll add one just... one more point, one more piece to that, which is to do broader impacts. Well, you need to actually put some money toward it, too. So. Um, it's, it is really obvious to a reviewer, not only what Jeff just said, if you like have great ideas, but don't have the capacity to do it. But if you are saying, yeah, we're gonna do all this stuff and we're gonna give it $5,000. Well, you're not gonna get very much for $5,000. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. That is, you know, two things that I often tell people about broader impacts is you have to put your money where your mouth is because reviewers will absolutely you know i can't tell you how many proposals i've reviewed where they say well we're gonna you know put together a this uh, exhibit for a museum or whatever and then there's no money behind it and so how how does that happen if there's no money behind it right that doesn't happen in a vacuum and if people you know if that's not part of their job it's not it's just not credible to make claims and then not resource them and that's such an easy sort of uh, uh, yeah. problem that, that stands out. If I could make one more point, Chris, um, you know, I've had, uh, I, I have a, uh, some, some, uh, some students of mine who've gone on into academia and, you know, I've been fortunate enough to mentor some junior faculty in academia. And, you know, I, I get asked this question, what types of broader impacts, you know, should I go after, right? You know, because there's a perception that, um, that there's a kind of boilerplate checklist of things that you need to accomplish in broader impacts and that NSF is going to be looking for that. So you need to contribute to curriculum development. You need to demonstrate the importance for you know, solving societal problems, kind of the broader technical impacts. You need to talk about the impacts on your discipline. You need to, you need to find ways to recruit and engage and support underrepresented students in, in, in the research. Um, and they feel like they have to, they have to be, you know, uh, to hit every one of those. I've been on review panels where, where program officers say, no, you don't have to do that. You don't have to hit every single, you know, what, what we conventionally think of as a broader impact topic. Um, because we understand that there's just one of you, you know, and, and you might not be able to do all of this, but what you do choose, you have to choose well, and it has to be credible and you have to put, you know, you know, your money where your mouth is. So my advice is usually, what are you passionate about? Are you really passionate about, you know, curriculum reform and, and, and uh, or creating new creative, uh, uh, innovative classes, you know, and then place some emphasis there. Are you really passionate about high school outreach and, and underserved communities? Well, then put your, put your effort there because, you know, your interest and passion in a topic is going to come through in the proposal. Absolutely. Um, and then assessment is also another piece here that um, also stands out with broader impacts is that, you know, we, we can say, okay, well, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do this. Um, and, but the, the obvious question is, well, how do you know it was effective? 
um, how do you know that you actually accomplished anything from doing this? Um, and so having an assessment piece, a piece where um, you're able to essentially get information from people beforehand and then after and assess whether or not you were effective at getting your message across. Um, that's, a, that's also a really useful piece if you're trying to do public engagement. How are you going to assess whether that public engagement worked, whether it did anything to change people's perception, perspective, etc. So, um, so the resources and assessment um, are pieces of a broader of a good broader impact section that really again set it apart from just a typical broader impact section that someone with two days left before the deadline said, oh God, I gotta finish this up, right? It's a very different, it, it, they're very different beasts and it's very obvious uh, to, uh, to a seasoned reviewer. Sunshine, I don't know if you have any more on, on broader impacts before we move on, because again, this is sort of your, your home. Yeah, I, there's, um, Jacob asked a really great question in the chat, which um, we're kind of responding to. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said thus far. And I, I really appreciate, Chris, your point about um, measuring what you're achieving, you know, so that broader impacts um, also, like any aspect of your research, are potentially meaningless if you're not measuring what you've actually achieved as, it, you know, it, in comparison to what you said you were trying to achieve. So uh, having a plan for your broader impacts, impacts that is not just about doing something, but about measuring what you have achieved is also really important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and as far as understanding, you know, where at a university to find that stuff, yeah. Uh, I absolutely think that talking to, um, you know, people who have been around for a while, who have ideas about, okay, well, you know, you could go talk to this person, you could go talk to this person. Um, there, there's so many different types of outreach that are happening depending on what type of proposal you're putting together. I mean, we, the uh, CELS as a college runs the entire 4-H program for the state. There's a huge opportunity to engage if, if you're, you know, doing something along those lines. Um, the, the SURF program that, you know, there's so many different programs happening um, at every university that depending on what your passion is, you can find something that will, you could use in a proposal that will be effective and meaningful and doesn't require you to take on that entire burden. Okay. All right. Any other questions about, sorry, the chat was hidden for me. Okay. All right. We'll see you later, Sunshine. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, what else was I going to talk about here? Uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the time here. Okay, so there, there's a variety of different um, types of awards. I'm not going to dig heavily into this document because it's it can be a little tedious as these types of documents go. Um, and if you, you know, anyone can download this and, and jump to any section that uh, is of particular interest. Um, and after the break, we'll talk a little bit about the logistics of, of working these proposals into the system. Um, but uh, one thing that I just wanted to uh, touch on, why don't we get maybe into um, how NSF is sort of organized. Uh, it, can you see, did that switch okay? We good with the, we're now on NSF webpage. Someone give me a thumbs up or something. Yes, maybe, okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, All right. Um, so, these are the different directorates um, at NSF. So here's bio, comp science. Um, so NSF funds a huge range. So um, unlike say USDA, which is very sort of narrowly focused, um, NIH is really focused on human health um, and any sort of impacts with human health. Um, NSF has a much broader um, net of things that it uh, funds. So ev everything from sort of social and behavioral work math, um, geo, engineering, um, re, uh, education research, all sorts of stuff. So there's a huge um, swath of, um, of what NSF actually funds um, given its budget. Um, and in some cases there are, um, uh, so for instance, if anyone's doing oceanography, 
Um, interestingly, it's actually funded through geoscience. Um, all of, a lot of oceanography is funded through the geoscience um, program. So not through the biological science. Um, essentially the way, so uh, as a marine biologist, I'm sort of often caught in sort of in between these two programs. Um, and the way people have explained it to me generally is that uh, if you can basically scuba dive or snorkel, you're in bio. If you have to get a ship, you're in oceanography. So um, it's, it's sort of split out that way. Okay, so um, if we look at the, so these are the different groups within biology. So um, it, biology is subsection into uh, a few different uh, programs here. Uh, the one that I most commonly uh, go to is uh, DEB, although um, we've gotten funding from iOS as well. But, um, and then within each program, so this is, um, this is DOB is the evolutionary, uh, mostly environmental and evolutionary type uh, programs, but each one again is sort of subsection into um, some additional, um, uh, additional uh, panels, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, one thing you can find through here is you can, uh, on the sidebar of all of these uh, programs, so no matter what, um, sort of NSF has one template for all of these different, um, different directorates, unlike other places like uh, NIH, which is all over the place, but, um, and you can find what awards, you can actually go in and search different awards, you can search by state, you can search by um, PI, you can search by university, you can do a lot of different things to kind of get an idea of what, um, for instance, what does DEB fund? So you could uh, search by keyword, all these types of things. So if you have an idea and you're interested in trying to pitch it to the right program, um, this is one way to kind of decide who do I talk to here? Um, who, you know, which program should I go to with this particular idea? Um, then there's their funding opportunities, which are just under this funding section here. Um, and again, a lot of these programs fund um, not only their core programs, but they are also involved in some um, what they call cross-cutting programs, such as Advance, for instance, which is um, uh, organizational change for gender equality in STEM. Uh, pretty much all of the uh, different directorates fund something through the Advance program. Um, then there are some specific ones like dimensions in biodiversity, uh, the core programs. And so these are all um, programs that DEB funds proposals through. Now you'll notice that they have um, deadlines or due dates. You can actually sort by due date um, in bio. And I don't know if engineering has done this, Jeff, you can weigh in, but bio with their core programs um, has done something uh, in my mind somewhat cruel and they've gone to no deadlines. Okay, um, and I, I can, I'm not gonna go into detail about why they've done this, but essentially uh, they did a pilot program in geoscience. They went to no deadlines um, and they found that their submission rate dropped by 40%. Why? Because we are all creatures of deadlines. Um, and you know, if, if there's a deadline, then there's a time when it has to be done if there's no deadline, well, uh, this thing's more important right now, I'll get to it next week, et cetera, et cetera. And so bios um, submission rates uh, dropped by 45% in the last year. So um, has engineering gone to that system or are they still on a deadline system, Jeff? So <clears throat> it depends on the program within engineering. I think most of the programs have gone to no deadline which yes, is horrible. <laughs> I mean, it's great, but it's horrible right. at the same time. You know, yeah. you really have to have deadlines to drive it forward. It sounds great, but in practice, uh, it just <laughs> means that you end up submitting everything six months later than you should have, yeah. um, at least. So yeah, so that's what uh, a lot of NSF programs have, have started doing. Um, and there's a variety of driving factors there, but um, they're essentially, uh, holding two panels uh, per year, but there's no defined time when they're holding them. So basically once they get enough proposals in the hopper, they decide to uh, run a panel. So it's, um, it's more at the discretion of the program officers now than it has been in the past. Um, so yeah, 
So that's uh, sort of the, the way that they're now running it. Um, in order to find, let's see, go over here to programs. Okay, so um, I mentioned that, so this is, again, this is sort of a hierarchy here. You've got DB as the, um, as the sort of overarching umbrella here. Um, and these are the different panels essentially that uh, DEB holds. So there's a ecosystem, an evolutionary one, a population an ecology one, and a systematics and biodiversity. Now, obviously there, there's some crosstalk between them. Um, and uh, I, there's some proposals that sometimes get co-funded by some of these programs, but essentially um, you wanna find the one that best fits your proposal. And then once you get into here, um, you've got a list of program officers. Now, one thing that um, NSF does that is different from, I think, pretty much any other funding agency that I can think of, is they have two types of program officers. They have um, program officers who, uh, that's their permanent job. They're there, uh, you know, for, for a career, for instance. Um, but they also have what are called rotating program officers. And about half of the staff um, in any particular uh, program is rotating program officers. And these are people who come in uh, from anywhere from a year to three years. They are people like Jeff and I who work at a university, want to take a look at what, um, you know, what NSF looks like from the other side, take uh, a leave from the university, and then NSF takes over their salary. And uh, they can stay anywhere from one to three years, but there's a cap of three years. And a program officer that's in a, um, a rotation program like that cannot actually, <laughs> so they actually have rules where you can't then jump to another rotator position. So um, there, there's certain rules about how you can kind of move about, but typically the rotators go in for a couple of years, then return to life as a faculty member. Um, while they're at NSF, they can't uh, manage any proposals. So if they have any cur current funding, they need to transfer that to a different PI at the institution. Um, and then when you come back, you're actually barred from um, submitting to your panel, uh, the panel you were working for, for a year. Um, after that, it's, uh, it's fair game. Does it work pretty similar in engineering? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what the reason why it's set up this way um, is to both have sort of institutional memory with the typical program officers, but then um, bring in people who are going to, you know, be, you know, people who are right now doing the science, hopping into NSF for a little bit. Um, and so there's a there's sort of a, a culture there of um, trying to keep things as fresh as possible so that you don't have people who are there for 20 years feel a bit out of touch with the science and, you know, are, but are still controlling the funding. Um, now it's, as someone who is um, proposing regularly to a, um, to a certain panel, you get to know fairly quickly who are the rotating program officers and who aren't just because you see the same names for a while and other ones turn over really often. Um, and it's not uncommon for, you know, oftentimes I might reach out to my own program officer, but, I, but in some cases I might reach out to a different program officer um, in the program who I know is a permanent one if I have different questions. And, and it kind of, um, again, that's sort of an experience thing and is something that um, it, it's helpful if you, if you know someone else who's been applying to a certain program um, so that you can kind of get a feel for it. But, you always have one program officer who handles your particular proposal. Um, and then you can reach out to other uh, program officers depending on uh, your questions. I don't know if Jeff, you feel the same way. Okay, so someone just asked, um, if you're working for a panel position, um, do you recommend not taking on graduate students during that time? So it's actually not um, so, Usually, there's a negotiation uh, whereby people will go, will um, send or have some time in their schedule during the year where they go back and work with their lab. I mean, it's obviously at this point right now, 
given the last year, we're, we're all pretty used to working remotely. We're all pretty used to, um, you know, having lab meetings remotely, those kinds of things. Um, so people do still run labs um, while they're at NSF, especially if they're only going to stay for a year, um, because to clear out your lab, go to NSF for a year, then come back and try to start things up from scratch. Um, that, you know, that, that's a, it's a challenging way to kind of to do it. So a lot of people do keep on um, students, do mentor them remotely, uh, do go back to their home institution for chunks of time to, you know, for committee meetings, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's it's really up to the, the PI. Yeah, I believe um, NSF might even pay for, you know, one plane ticket a week. Yeah, it, it's, um, I can't remember, I don't know if it's a week, I think it might be a month. It might be, it could be a month, yeah. But um, yeah, but so they, they do encourage, um, you know, they don't want you to just go there and forget about your lab. That, that's not healthy for, for anyone, the students or, or the PIs. Okay, um, any other questions uh, on, on this piece of it? Okay, um, all right, I forget. Uh, Trying to remember what we're co covering this from now and then for the next um, session of it. Okay. Um, are there other questions about um, the sort of, so we'll, after the break, we're going to talk about the, the sort of nitty gritty about the logistics of putting a budget together, of how you put a proposal together that's going to be compelling. Um, are there any questions that have come up um, about this part of the process about figuring out how to submit, where to submit those types of things. I, I'll ask a quick question if that's okay. Um, I guess in general, because I know you have to submit these grants through the research office ahead of time and how far in advance do you usually try to start working on a grant to make sure you're accounting for all those different things before the due date, or there's not a due date, but if you right. set one in your head. <laughs> yeah, so for instance, I'm, I'm in the middle of working on one and I've mentally set my due date to before classes start, right? Just so that I have, uh, well, A, I'm gonna have a lot less time and then uh, B, it just sort of gives me a time frame. Um, it, so I guess my, my answer would be, it really depends. Um, so if I'm, putting together a collaborative proposal um, that's gonna involve multiple institutions. Uh, I am starting that process anywhere from six to nine months ahead, um, only because it takes a lot longer to get everyone, you know, get people all kind of focused on the same thing, um, to get different institutions to, you know, the paperwork and all that type of thing. Um, that, that's a longer process. If I'm doing a proposal that is just myself, um, I, I mean, personally, I probably do anywhere from six to eight weeks ahead, but it's a little bit different when you're borrowing a lot of text at this stage of my career. When I was first writing proposals from scratch with very little text to sort of mix and match from other proposals and other um, you know, other bits of writing. Um, it, it's more of a three, four month process, I would say. I don't know if you feel the same way, Jeff. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, and the other, the other thing I will absolutely mention is that um, you want to, so you have to leave at least a week for the other stuff. And like I said before, everyone thinks, oh, well, you just write the proposal. But then there's a one page summary, there's a data management plan, there's a postdoc mentoring plan, there's the budget justification, there's all this other stuff that needs to get written, uh, needs to be prepared, needs to be, you know, vetted, all these types of things. Um, and really, you know, that's an extra, at least an extra week of work on top of the actual proposal. Um, as far as submitting to the university, so the university wants to see it. Um, that, so when it comes to getting it through or approved at the university level, there's really, um, you need to nail down the budget and the budget justification. Once you've nailed that down, 
um, you can basically give them a summary of the proposal. The proposal doesn't have to be finished, but the budget and budget justification, once it's gone through the approval process, that is nailed down. You cannot change that again. If you have to change the budget, you have to get everything reapproved. Um, and you need to have that process done at least a week ahead of time. Um, oftentimes it's faster than that, but sometimes it's not. Um, and at least in cells, cells wants to see the, um, the project, uh, I think they want at least three days with it. And then the research office is asking for four days. So you're, you're really looking at a week ahead of time before, um, you, before the deadline, if there is one. That answer questions. All right. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, other questions on this part? I have a question. I just got curious about the budget. Um, so let's say um, a PI made this proposal and he has um, X amount of money, you know, for I don't know, um, Y amount of um, years. Then things change over time. Um, but you have that amount for this type of stuff. How, how do you adapt? Like now have COVID, right? So this is actually they got delayed. Um, uh, orders are being complicated. Prices are increasing. So how, how do you adapt to this type of situation if you have that amount of money to yeah. spend in the com? You know. Yeah. So that's actually NSF's pretty flexible on that. Um, and that uh, so what NSF does, which again is different from. Uh, NIH uh, in particular, is that they, they send the whole lump of money to the university at, on day one, uh, at least in bio. Uh, there's a couple of records that, that do it year to year, but, um, but bio sends all the money up front. Um, what that means is that you have the ability to um, change your budget and do reallocations of money from different categories. We'll talk about the categories um, once we get into the budget next. Uh, next part of this session, but um, so you're actually able to move money from one category to another. Now there are limits. Obviously, you can't you know move two hundred thousand from this to this without getting prior approval. But within reason, you're able to move money around. And then when it comes to year to year, there is no um, there's no hard deadline on when that money has to be spent. It can be spent any time during that grant proposal or during that time. And then oftentimes, um, in fact, I don't think I've ever had a proposal or a, a grant that we didn't ask for what's called a no-cost extension. And a no-cost extension is an extension on the time that you can, um, that you can spend the money. Um, typically, your first no-cost extension, you can request up to a year, and they pretty much automatically guarantee it. So you can essentially... So what often happens with a proposal is that you're getting to the end of the allotted time and you have some small amount of money left. Maybe, maybe it's $20,000. Now you don't wanna give $20,000 back when you could spend it on something. Um, and you also don't wanna spend it right at the last second you know, in a hurry. So instead you get a no cost extension that allows you to spend that money um, for grant related activities for another year. Um, they will approve a, an additional year, but you really need to justify it. Um, now, granted, with COVID and everything, everyone's being a little bit more flexible, and that's a, a little bit different right now. But um, in a typical, uh, a typical scenario, a year is pretty much guaranteed. A second year needs to be justified. If I could add to that, Chris. Yeah. Um, so NSF money is, is, is great money to get, in part because it's a grant. So, uh, and, and when you receive a grant, that's different than a contract and it's different than a cooperative agreement. Yeah. So with a grant, you are not, you know, um, it, it's granting you the money based on what you proposed, but they're not like strictly holding you accountable for those specific goals. They, they, they put the faith, I mean, the grant goes to your institution. It doesn't go to you directly. You know, you are the manager, the PI of that, that, that award. Um, but they're basically saying, listen, you wrote a great proposal. We liked your ideas. We're going to give you money to, to work on it. And if it works out, great. I mean, it can fail. And, and a lot of times projects don't work out the way you, most of the time, nearly <laughs> all the time, projects don't work out the way you thought because the field's advancing and things become more relevant. 
uh, your capabilities change, an instrument dies, you know, I mean, there's so many different reasons why it doesn't work out. And, and so, Tanya, in, in NSF world, they are very, they, they can be very flexible. There are certain, you know, federal rules for changing budget categories and stuff like that. But by and large, program officers, they will tell you, they've told me, spend your money. Because you have to remember, NSF receives their budget from, uh, you know, from the federal government, obviously, uh, every year. And what happens when you don't spend all your budget? Well, then your budget decreases for the next year. So NSF is really, really encourages faculty to spend their money. And I think as a result, um, you know, it's a grant plus they build in that flexibility so that, so that uh, you know, faculty members and graduate students and postdocs when they receive these types of fellowship grants as well can be nimble and quick and adaptive to situations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, again, I, so we're just finishing up a, a five-year um, grant and you know, a lot of NSF grants are three years. Um, and so a five-year grant, you know, that's a huge amount of time for things to change. And it, indeed, you know, we set out in one direction. Uh, there was a shiny object over here that we followed and, you know, ended up going, and that's totally fine. As long as you're productive, as long as you move things forward, generally in the, the scope of what you talk uh what you proposed um the nsf is fine with that all right other questions i guess i would just follow you know the, the on the flip side um there are some department of defense or maybe state agencies like rhode island dem or transportation um they are contracts and when you have contracts you know, you might have very specific deliverables uh, annually or quarterly even that you really are, you can't deviate on. So you have to be aware of that depending on the source of funding that you're trying to pursue. And even NIH, uh, while it's a grant, it's year to year and you need to report on progress and they can cut your budget for the next year based on your progress and spending. So I've, you know, have colleagues who uh, wrote a proposal for say a million dollars uh, over five years, but by the end, by the time they're in year three, their year four budget's been cut by fifteen percent. And so you know, again, N NSF when they grant you the money, they give you the money and off you go. NIH is a yearly, you know, how do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Um, so even though it's a grant, it's still more tightly regulated than than the NSF is. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we're at our, our 10 o'clock hour. Um, and uh, I think we can take a, are we taking a 15 minute break? Yeah. 15 minutes. We'll okay. be back here at 10, 15. Okay. So when we come back, um, there, there should be an email in your um, mailbox that has a budget template that we're going to play with um, when we come back. Um, and we'll get into both the logistics of budgets and then we'll get into the logistics of um, uh, sort of the the aspects of a proposal and putting that together. All right. Great. All right. See you at ten fifteen. Thank you. Uh, if you haven't, can you in the chat just uh, mention that you haven't? Maybe include your email address so we can get it to you. I'm going to take that either as everyone's gotten it or no one's hearing it. Cool. Okay. Um, I just wanted, so I was catching up on the chat because I uh, when I was sharing screen, it's hard to see, but uh, I, I agree with um, Jeff on the mentor thing. Um, the So everyone has a variety of sort of official and unofficial mentors, I would say. Um, and so uh, there's these sort of official mentors that you're assigned as, uh, so there's usually one in your department and one outside your department um, who are people who, sort of get assigned to you as mentors by the university formally. Um, but of course, we all find informal 
um, mentors. And uh, oftentimes those are the ones that happen more organically and, and uh, in both directions, you know, I've, I've found more senior mentors, um, but also now, um, now that I sadly am, I guess, considered a senior member of my department, <laughs> which just hurts a little, but um, so I've uh, also become a mentor for um, some of the um, more recently hired uh, faculty in the department as well. So it works both ways. All right. you, you know you arrive, Chris, when uh, your mentors are now junior faculty. Right. <laughs> <laughs> which, which you know, actually, and, and it happens a little bit. I there are some there are. Uh, I'm amazed at like the quality of the junior faculty, you know, and how adept they are to you know thinking thinking broader about their work, right, and and the societal aspect to it, and everything. So there's it's interesting. Yeah, it's not an age thing, really. It's it's you know who do you look up to and yeah, and who inspires you. Yeah, absolutely. We have some people really, really tearing it up and it's, it's really nice to see. So, all right. Uh, okay. So why don't we start, um, I guess let's start with the uh, proposal itself and then we'll get to the budget piece. Um, so I don't, Jeff, I don't know if you have um, some examples that you want to just show. I was going to show a couple um, examples of proposals that, um, I've either submitted and one that I'm working on, but just just to, as examples of things that um, that I like to see in a proposal. Um, I, I I will I will look and find some. Yeah, just if you can just take one up or something like that. Um, so I spent when I first got here. Um, I, so I did my PhD and postdoc in Canada. Very different funding system. Very different setup. Um, and so I first uh, got to URI and I started submitting proposals. And um, I kept uh, submitting proposals and they kept getting bounced back to me, uh, basically saying, uh, where's your preliminary data? Um, now, I, I didn't sort of understand what that meant at the time. Um, and what, what that essentially means is that you need to have, so the reason when a junior faculty member starts, we provide them what's called startup money. That's money that um, they use to kind of get the research off the ground. Um, and the reason we do that is because there's a certain expectation at funding agencies that you will have um, what are, what's called preliminary data. Um, preliminary data has gotten increasingly less preliminary um, and it's to the point now where um, if, if I don't have essentially the first aim done already, then I, I'm hesitant to submit something. Um, it's got to be, it, it, it tends to be proof of concept to, to a bit of an extreme. Um, so it is really important um, to have, when, when you're putting a proposal together, to not only have a good idea, but to have data that demonstrates the concept. So that's really, really critical. And it took me a while to figure that out because uh, A, I'm slow and B, um, I, I didn't sort of, I didn't come from uh, the NSF system uh, growing up, so to speak. And so it didn't, it didn't, uh, it wasn't clear to me what that required, but it turns out you actually need quite a bit of data. Um, and it took a while for my lab to produce enough to actually um, start getting proposals um, coming in. So uh, that's sort of the first step. Uh, the second thing that's really, really important, I find, for um, getting a feel for your sort of proposal style um, is to be on a panel. Um, so grant panels are, um, uh, at NSF, uh, they run, again, maybe twice a year and um, for, for each different uh, group. And they're, they're really critical, um, well, A, it's the process by which grants are chosen. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But from my own perspective, being on a panel uh, gives me the opportunity to look through um, a, a, a whole bunch of different proposals. And when you do it in that way, in a concentrated way, um, it very quickly becomes apparent to you what what stands out to you, um, not just from a sort of scientific perspective, but also 
a presentation perspective, um, there's some sort of key pieces of um, a how a proposal is presented that make an enormous difference. Um, you have to, and I, and I always sort of joke with my students about this, but you really need to write a proposal for someone who has already read four proposals today. It's probably 1030, they probably had a scotch. You need a proposal, you need that as your reviewer, okay? So picture that person when you're writing your proposal that, you know, is tired, is doing this on top of their regular job, is doing this volunteer work um, as part of their duty to the general community, but already worked a full day and is already kind of, you know, it, it, it's a lot of work, especially, you know, on panels that I've been on where you get 18 proposals, that's 18 times 15 pages, you know, you start doing the math and it's, it's a huge amount of work. So reviewers are tired, generally speaking. Now your, your, your proposal is reviewed by two different types of people. Um, you have panelists who are the people who are reading 18 proposals in a go and are gonna go to Washington, well, not anymore, but uh, in pre-COVID days, um, would go to Washington, would sit in a room for two and a half days and battle it out for whatever proposals they think are important to find. Um, the, then there are people called ad hoc reviewers. And those reviewers are um, people who are gonna review one proposal for this panel, maybe one proposal for another panel, but they're getting it because they are someone in your field who has very specific knowledge about exactly what you're doing. Okay, the people on the panel may not be in, in your, you know, so I, I work on microbial eukaryotes and algae. I might be, might have a plant person reviewing on, on panel reviewing them, okay? But in the ad hocs, they'll go to someone who is specifically in my field. It may not be in the US, might be somewhere else, might be in Europe, might be in Australia. Um, I've had, People come up to me at conferences and say they've um, reviewed my proposals from uh, all sorts of different places. So um, they find people who are experts in that field. So you really need to write your proposal in a way that, that pleases both those audiences. And that's a bit of a challenge because you need the detail in there that's going to get your proposal okayed by someone who knows the nitty gritty of that field. But you also can't bog someone down who isn't in your field with all this nitty gritty that they don't care about. They want the big idea. They don't care about, you know, exactly how you're gonna process each sample. So it's, it's a balance. You really have to find that balance to engage people, um, but also provide enough detail so that people can dig into the proposal if they're, if they're going to, okay? Is that clear for enough of that? Jeff, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. Well, you know, I think um, you're, I mean, you hit the nail right on the head and I'll kind of elaborate on some of your points uh, when I show an example, if, if you'd like me to show an example of a proposal. I pulled up the most recently funded NSF award that we received, so. Yeah, I was gonna, <laughs> um, yeah, I was gonna show a couple, have you show one, great. I, you know, what I was gonna say is that, um, I mean, I remember when I was a, was a PhD student and finishing up my PhD and you know, it, in talking with my advisor about, you know, writing my dissertation and you kind of, you go through those, that, <laughs> that kind of trial and tribulation of, of putting it together. And, and she was, uh, you know, she kind of had a, had a great way of explaining it. You know, it was, you, you spend all this time trying to really focus on something, right, on the details. And the dissertation is the point in your, uh, you know, graduate studies where you now have to take a step back and you have to think about the larger context of your work and who it's gonna potentially impact and how it advances your field. And so I, I was, as, as, as Chris was um, discussing kind of the mindset of the reviewer and, and you know, different types of reviewers, I want you, I, I would just say, be thinking about you know, where you are now with the understanding that you've been spending a lot of time thinking very detailed about something specific and trying to publish papers in that area. Um, so it'll come, right? It's, you, you learn quickly, you know, uh, the postdoc is one transition where you start to get a little bit of space and you start to think a little bit differently about your work. Um, 
and then when you start your faculty position, you, you know, you really have to be able to do both, you know, be really detailed, but also be able to step back, be critical of your work, poke holes in your work, but also be able to explain, you know, why, why should that person care about what you're doing, right? Or, or explaining it to your, you know, to a relative, right? Why is your work important? You know, and that was always really hard for me to do when I was a grad student. People would ask me, what do you do? And I'm like, you really want to know about supercritical fluids? I mean, I can tell you, but, you know, um, <laughs> but, but you find a way to do it. So finding that balance is really important, as, as Chris was mentioning. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that ability to lead with big picture, um, it, it comes with experience, but it, it's so critical when it comes to grant proposals. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times uh, especially early on, where I, I wrote a proposal and someone was like, well, why didn't you talk about this? And in my head, I'm like, I did. And then I go into the proposal and it's like, oh, well, I completely left that out. Because, you know, it's like when you're reading your own writing, sometimes you just insert a word that's missing because it's in your head. But when you actually, you know, step back and look at the, the full proposal, you recognize, oh, yeah, I, I left that out. And that, that was a big mistake. Um, because, I know this, but that doesn't mean that someone else knows that. Um, so you take things for granted. I would say just one more kind of word of caution in this area. I, I think, you know, a lot of times when we try to take a step back and describe the bigger kind of societal relevance or importance of our work, um, we tend to uh, embellish a little bit. Yeah. You got to be really careful about that. You know, if you're, you know, if you're doing something very detailed, a new nanomaterial or something, let's say, you know, for a medical application, that's great, you know, and then you need to explain, you know, the, the challenges in that field and, and how what you're doing can help address some of those, but you really got to choose your words carefully, um, you know, because uh, the reviewers will say, well, hold on a second, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be at that level, right, right, it can show promise for something, but it doesn't have to be the end all, you yeah. know, new therapy that's going to cure all disease, for instance. Yeah. Describing your stuff in the context of making fundamental major change is not always the best approach, given that we all build things as part of general science and move things along progressively. There, there's very few massive leaps. Um, so trying to describe your work as a massive leap can be problematic, for sure. Um, okay, so let me just, um, I'm gonna show an example here. Uh, okay, uh, so this is a proposal that got funded a while ago, um, and uh, some people who have taken class will be familiar or at least have seen it before. Um, but so there's a couple key things that I just want to point out in terms of how you, uh, the, the sort of aesthetic of a proposal, because believe it or not, that's actually pretty important. Um, and so one thing that I really like to do is I'd like to never go more than a page or two without some sort of figure. Um, because again, that tired reviewer is, there's nothing more intimidating, well, not intimidating, but it's nothing more deflating than being on page 10 of a proposal turning and just seeing a complete wall of text after another wall of text. And it's just, as a reviewer, it's just like, oh, okay, all right, let's get through this. And you lose focus, right? You're not focused on, the proposal, you're focused on just getting through this one so that you can get to the next one. Maybe you're on the plane to NSF. I would never do that. Uh, but, you know, it, it, so there's a time frame here that you're, you know, you're under a time constraint. So you want to make your reviewer like your proposal, not just from the scientific perspective, but also make it easy for them to digest. Um, so I like to use headings, um, you know, that are uh, in some way break up the text. So for me, I, I tend to use this sort of block above, you know, in, in, with the white writing. It, it doesn't matter how you do it, but, you know, just having a bold thing up there doesn't really break up, visually break things up very well. So I, I like to do it this way. Um, then there's, you know, adding a major figure early on uh, is something that I like to do to, you know, draw people in, say, okay, you know, Introduce the problem here very briefly, show them a figure like this is this is what I'm talking about. This is the major point of this proposal. Um, and so get people hooked early. If you can't get someone hooked on your proposal in the first page or two, 
you've already lost them. Okay, they're not going to on page 12 think, oh, that's why this is a cool proposal. You need to get people hooked early. It's really important. And so to that end, I like to put my the objectives of the proposal, specific aims, whatever you want to call them, somewhere in the first two pages. Okay, so usually I lead with some sort of brief introduction, think of it like an abstract almost, uh, a little bit longer, and then give people, okay, where are we going with this? Okay, so here are my objectives. And then start with that so that people know right off the bat what your end goal is here. Some people will you know, wait and put their objectives on page four or five. It just, to me, you know, you've gone through this long introduction that I just, you know, weeded through. Now you're telling me where you're going. It, it would have really helped to know that sort of earlier on. Um, and so I tend to, again, you know, break things up, leave space. That's the other thing that is really critical. When you're writing your first proposals, you want to get everything in there. And so you find ways to like, cram text in nooks and crannies and make it this like, you know, think of that German bread that is so dense and you like a chainsaw to get through it. That, you know, that's what some proposals come in as. And again, from a reviewer perspective, that is just terrible. It just makes it so hard to work through. So provide some tech, some, provide some space. You know, I tend to start with single space. You know, other other people tend to shrink it. You know, eleven point, ten point space. Don't don't do that to your reviewers. Um, and so again, figures, figure captions. You know, I try and uh, use different color, uh, different color, slightly different color background to have figure captions jump out a little bit, um, and just break things up. Provide your reviewers some visual relief. Um, and, and leave some white space. You know, I oftentimes will get proposals where they'll take this, you know, this white space that you see here and they'll find a way to jam it really tight and close. And again, that, it's just hard for a reviewer. I don't know, if, Jeff, if you feel that way as a reviewer. Absolutely, yeah, that's, that's one of the first things I think, uh, you know, from a formatting or organization perspective, you know, that, that the advice that you'll get from somebody good at writing proposals is leave, leave some white space. Yeah. Right. It, it's really, um, and it, it's so hard to do sometimes, especially when you, you know, you finally get through the proposal and you're at 16 pages and you think, okay, well, I can take all this information and just reduce the white space and kind of jam everything on the 15. Sure. You can do that. Or you can actually go back and be a bit more critical about what you've written. And there's always stuff that you can pull out if, you know, if you're really trying. Um, and so I, I prefer that approach both as a, as a writer, although it's painful sometimes, uh, and then as a reviewer, especially. Um, okay, so, you know, in some cases, uh, a couple figures on page, fine, break, break it up, um, give people some, uh, something to just change their focus, okay? So go look at this figure for a little bit, then come back, and then we'll, you know, it, I think it really, really helps in terms of how just the reviewer's mentality um, is going through this. Um, and, you know, sometimes, like, sometimes I just end up putting a, a picture on here because it's pretty, you know, <laughs> like, it just, um, you know, in this one, I didn't even include a caption. We just said, you know, the, the image shown it right. So it's not even, it's really just there to be like, okay, isn't this cool, right? It, it, it's, it's just a visual distraction to kind of give the reviewer a little bit of relief. Um, and so there's all sorts of different sections. This was a big collaborative project. So there's this project management um, and there's a bunch of stuff like that. There's uh, again, give your, um, also give your reviewers a timeline. Okay, so what are you gonna do? And you know, how are you gonna organize this sort of temporally? Um, and so it's often good to give your reviewers some sort of timeline, give them an idea, okay, well, you know, this part of the project is going to be done by the end of year two, and we hope to have a manuscript out right after that, those, those types of things. Um, let me see, uh, what else was I gonna point out here? Oh, there's another, so as, as far as um, important pieces of uh, a proposal, some sections you want to especially, so the way I typically organize a proposal is the first aim is locked in. It's gonna happen, it's gonna work. 
I can provide you tons of data to show you this is going to work. Aim two, we've got a bit of data suggestive, you know, almost certainly going to work. Aim three, it's usually the reach. And so aim three is often the aim where I'm saying, okay, given aim one and aim two, um, you know, we're going to get those done. And then uh, we're going to, in addition to that, do this extra super cool thing. Okay. Now, one really important piece, just from a grant writing perspective, and this is the most ridiculous and easy stock claim that the reviewers will, will throw at you, is that if you have dependent aims, so if aim two depends on the success of aim one, and aim three depends on the success of aim two, a reviewer will say, well, if aim one doesn't work out, then for two years, you're twiddling your thumbs. Okay, so you do not want to have aims that are interdependent um, in a in a sort of make or break way. They should all build on one another. They should all you know, be synergistic, but you really don't wanna have an aim that depends entirely, its success depends entirely on the success of a previous aim. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so yeah, in, in other, um, in certain proposals, so this was again, uh, this is, um, a big collaborative proposal. And so we, we included a section relationship to other projects. So this project was somewhat similar to other ones that have been funded by this program. And so we wanted to basically say, look, we're not redoing what's already been done. This has some, you know, some relationship with other projects, but it's not the same thing. Um, and so, you know, there, there's certain sections that you want to include that for certain projects, um, that's sort of one of the ones that we had there. Um, again, a broader impact section should not be half a page that you threw on the end of a proposal. Um, you should give it, it some space. And, you know, again, we, we did several different things. We talked about images. Um, we're, we did a distributed RU, some curriculum development, but not every, there's several PIs on this. Not every PI was doing everything. Some PIs were focused on this. Um, some PIs were focused on a different piece. And so um, that made it uh, sort of uh, doable in the sense that it was um, not everyone's running around like a chicken with their head cut off. Um, I wanted to think what else. Oh, and then, the, so there's another um, one important section of NSF uh, proposals is that they want, if you've had previous funding, you have to include somewhere in the proposal what's called results from previous. And what that means is that you have to say, okay, I've had funding before and I didn't just, you know, spend it going out to dinner. Not that you could, but you know what I mean? They want to, um, reviewers want to see some productivity with previous money. And so uh, you need to include just a brief, what was the intellectual merit of the previous um, proposal? What were the broader impacts? And then, you know, what, what were the deliverables? So how many publications came out of that? How many... Um, you know, how many students went to conferences and gave talks? How many students were trained? How many undergrads were involved in the research? That type of thing. Okay, so um, it doesn't need to be long, but it does need to be a section of the proposal. Uh, Jeff, I don't know if you have thoughts on that one as well. No, I would agree. I think a lot of people skip over that part to some degree. Yeah, um, I think reviewers likely do but at the same time it, it needs to be there so oh i meant actually the proposal writers oh oh okay yeah will will not pay enough attention to right. it and it is kind of an important section because that gets discussed on you know on i wouldn't say on every proposal that gets discussed on a panel but on many of them people will say well what's their prior work yeah right they have a track record in this area they've been funded in a related area before and you have yeah. to describe it absolutely and so you only need to pick one proposal from, so if you've had multiple proposals funded, then you should pick the one that is most closely related to the work that you're proposing um, and kind of go from there. Um, so depending on what you're proposing in this new one, you may choose a different proposal um, to, to highlight in your previous. Um, and I do, Chris, I, yeah. I do have a proposal up. So if, if you yeah. want me to go through it when yeah. you're ready, I'll uh, just let me know. Yep, why don't you do that? And then I'll okay. quickly show one that I'm working on now and then we can move to the budget. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, let's see. Ah, there we go. Okay, share. 
So can you all see this screen here? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, so, th so the second reason I, I, I wanted to participate in this uh, workshop was to get ideas from Chris for my next proposals. Let's let's be honest here, right? We're all looking for ways to improve our proposals. Uh, it's interesting how how uh, um, it, it really it really doesn't change between field, biological sciences, cells, engineering, chemical engineering. Telling a good story is telling a good story. Putting together a good argument is putting together a good argument. And um, a lot of what Chris had mentioned, you know, I also adhere to. I have a couple, a couple of uh, this proposal actually gives a little bit of a, a different example, a, a kind of a twist on that to some degree, though. So, um, as as Chris had mentioned, so so one of my little uh, my little things is I always, I, for some reason, I always like to put the title on the top of the de project description. Just because when I'm reviewing proposals, you know, maybe you read the project summary first, and that seems like a natural break for me to go get a cup of coffee. And then I come back and I, I look at the project description and, and sometimes I don't always remember the title of the proposal. So it's just a little thing kind of th that I end up doing. So this was recently awarded, uh, at, well, it actually started in September um, and it's a single PI award looking at micro and nanoplastics at the sea surface micro layer and kind of the colloidal aspects behind it. Um, this particular, so as, as Chris mentioned, I, I always have a figure on the first page, maybe the second page, just to grab the attention early. And a figure that kind of demonstrates um, kind of big picture what you're thinking about, but also maybe the complexity of the problem that you're looking at. And then, but, and then also kind of shows that there's a pathway to some, some good science within that figure. So uh, I always do that. And I usually have kind of an introduction to the proposal, or which is almost like an executive summary, where again, you're listing those objectives and goals early on, right? Because, you know, I'll be honest, I usually schedule between 30 and 60 minutes per proposal when I'm reviewing. And normally it goes over, but that's my starting point. If the proposal's really bad, I don't waste my time and keep reading the whole thing in detail. I just come out and say, you know what, there's no hypotheses you know, or the hypotheses listed are totally invalid. It just doesn't make sense. You know, I'm sorry, but you know, they really need to rethink this idea. So it's my point being, um, <clears throat> you know, your, your, the reviewers are really time crunched and they're not gonna spend a lot of time on the proposal. Um, so capturing them early is really important. This particular proposal actually went to an engineering program and uh, that deals with kind of nanoscale interactions in the environment and in uh, biomedicine. So normally I would have come straight out and talked about my goals and objectives on the first page, but I was concerned that this, this uh, the panel wouldn't appreciate the importance of the sea surface microlayer and the role of kind of plastics in it. So I felt like I had to give a little bit more background than I normally would before I got to my my major um, objectives of the work. So, um, you know, I tr still tried to kind of start it out with a figure, but um, as you work your way through here, you know, breaking it up into kind of subsections, which they don't just, they're, they're, they're kind of action oriented subsections, right? You're not wasting space. You're, 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 you're telling this, this sea surface micro layer is significant. Right, so instead of a heading that just says sea surface microlayer, right, you can be an actionable um, kind of a, a subheading for people. So as you go through here, you know, uh, the first couple pages, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, current work and the, and the questions that have been raised based on that current work, you're kind of setting the stage for, okay, now because all of this, you know, what are, what are my hypotheses? Um, so it really is on about page four, you know, after going through here and kind of peppering it with, you know, more, we, we need a better understanding of this. We need to take a closer look at this. If we knew this, then we could prevent this type, type language um, is where, you know, I had a section on intellectual merit. Um, some, I believe that proposals have to have a section defined as intellectual merit and broader impacts now, or they get kicked out. Normally it was like inferred, right? The intellectual merit was, was all of the, the, the um, kind of, uh, you know, the theoretical, fundamental, experimental basis ex uh, behind, your, behind your work, but now you have to have a section. 
So this is where I started getting into hypotheses. And I found that- That's specifically true for the summary as well. They, they used to ask you to have them as boxes, but now you can't even submit a PDF. You have to submit it into boxes that are labeled that way. So yeah, but you do specifically have to have this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for this particular proposal, again, I you know I mentioned it was it was a little different, and I actually have served on this uh, this program's panel probably twelve times <laughs> over the last you know decade or so. So um, I'm pretty familiar with the type of uh, reviewer that's, and it's a it's a it's a broad background of reviewers. So you know, introducing the hypotheses, talking about the materials that we're interested in, and we plan on looking that looking at. Um, I usually, so one of the questions that an NSF panel gets asked is, is the work transformative? Uh, and of course, what are the broader impacts? And I, I started doing this early in my faculty position. I just have a section called transformative aspects. I, you know, I, so there's no, for that, for that reviewer that's really busy, that's kind of skimming through it, they read it. Yes. But, you know, read it, reading it quickly, it just pops out. Yeah. They address the transformative aspects of this work. Um, Again, because because building the story here required you know enough background so that the uh, kind of the diverse panel could appreciate the sea surface microlayer, then going into hypotheses, um, in this work I thought it was important to then show some preliminary data that we had gathered to support those hypotheses, and so these are preliminary results. They actually stemmed from a previously awarded NSF grant, so it worked out well. Um, before diving into the specific aims, right? So I told you this was important. I generated hypotheses related to it on how we can expand or improve upon, you know, the knowledge. Um, I then gave you some preliminary work supporting those hypotheses. And now I'm going to tell you what the goals are for this award. So admittedly, this is happening later than I normally would. But I, I felt in this proposal it was needed in order to bring everybody up to speed, all the reviewers up to speed before I said, OK, this is what we're going to do. Um, I, I've also uh, I found, too, that um, as when I'm reviewing, when I when I see an aim or an objective, I kind of like, OK, what was the rationale behind that aim? Right. Why is that important? And just a brief synopsis of the approach. You know, you get all that kind of high level, this is what we're gonna do, it's gonna be great, you're gonna love it, we're gonna use these cool tools. Um, and then, you know, this is what we're gonna get out of it. So I, I spend a little bit, I, I get a little more intellectual merit in here describing why we chose those aims. Um, and one thing that I do too, you know, uh, Sunshine had mentioned, um, you know, broader impacts and how important they were at Chris too, of course. Um, I oftentimes will will have an aim related to broader impact. I'll actually put that as part of the proposal instead of most, geez, nearly all proposals I review, broader impacts is a separate section with separate goals. I, I introduce it here because um, number one, it, it, it tells you that you take it seriously. It's actually an aim of the work. Uh, it also, I think, shows that you've thought about how it integrates with the other aims. So it's not kind of a separate category. Um, and then uh, let's see, here's that prior. So it just so happened that the results from my prior NSF award were a lot of the kind of preliminary data that we wanted to use um, to, uh, you know, to demonstrate our capability. So it worked out really well. And then I go into experimental details here. Um, so I'll just, I'll just kind of end. So this was, uh, oh, that was an experimental plan. So the broader impacts section, because you have to have a separate section, you need to kind of think about it that way. Um, thinking really, you know, being careful and, and planning it well, you know, a lot of times what will happen is um, in a broader impact section, a, uh, 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 you know, a person will describe how they have a long track record of working with undergraduate students, they have a long track record of you know, high school outreach or, you know, think about your broader impact activity. And we will continue doing it under this award is the implication. The, I usually rip those apart to say, well, you, so you didn't, you didn't, you didn't even attempt to come up with a creative way to use your current project or results from this, this proposal um, to build something new, to do something innovative in the broader impacts area. 
So you got to put a lot of thought into this. I agree. And, and like everything, the bar continues to go up in terms of, you know, what is expected and the, the, what was the, you know, bare minimum 10 years ago will get absolutely torched right now. And, you know, so everything, you know, the, the expectations uh, continue to, to move up. So, yeah, yeah. You know, and I think you, you, you have to have that timeline. And for large projects, you know, it, it, it also really helps you think through it um, as, a, as a team and a PI. Uh, for a single investigator, uh, you know, I kind of found it's like this obligatory piece that, you know, if, if, you, if you don't have it, the reviewers aren't going to be happy. If you do have it, they're just going to say, okay, they've got it, you know, and then that's going to be the end of it. So you got to dedicate a little space uh, to that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, there's, I'll go ahead and stop sharing uh, unless there's any, any questions. There, there was a question about, um, so at, I think as you can see, based on the, the two types of proposals we just showed you, there's really a lot up to your discretion into how you approach this. Um, the, and there was a question about um, something like reference uh, standards. So whether numerical versus um, name, um, so personally, I like to use name year um, specifically because what I like to do is highlight uh, my own lab's contributions. And then you keep seeing that name pop up over and over again. And, it, you know, so it's this person, you know, someone in my lab this year, someone in my lab a different year. So you can sort of see that. And I don't think that comes across from numerically. You can say, oh, well, we did this 11, but, and then you're supposed to remember, okay, 11 going forward, but from, um, but it doesn't demonstrate that, okay, this person, uh, you know, is the same person as this other person, which is a different reference. So from my perspective, I'd like to try and use that as, again, more reinforcement that we're doing this. Like, this is like, you know, we, we have, have a track record here. We've published in this field and we continue to do so, and you can see it right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for my, you know, I, I tend to do superscript numbers, but mostly because like the journals I publish in, you know, yeah. that's typically the reference style for the journals. Yeah, um, every, every field's gonna have different expectations. You know, what I do, as Chris mentioned, um, in in using the reference to, to make it clear that it's your work and when it keeps popping up, um, I also do that usually in the text, you know, we've shown that we, 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 we work in this area kind of language throughout the text yeah. um, to, to reinforce that too. I have used um, last name here before too. Yeah. And, and I think for the very reasons that Chris mentioned, it can be pretty effective. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's all personal preference. It just, I find as a reviewer, it's easier for me to take sort of digest a lab's contribution when you start seeing the same names over again, as opposed to trying to remember what the numbers are, because I'm never going to go look in the reference section to see what, you know, it, it's just, it's not going to happen. So um, like Jeff said, you know, if you're taking an hour to go through this document, plus all the ancillary documents, you, you know, you're not, you're not double checking references unless there's a real reason to. Um, and I just, I, I keep forgetting to touch on this, but one thing that Jeff mentioned earlier about this being sort of one of his favorite parts about um, the job, I, I actually agree because this is your, this is your chance to dream, right? This is your chance to say, look at all the cool stuff we could do if you gave us money. Whereas writing a proposal is like, oh, we did this stuff already. But the, the, this is sort of the aspirational writing, like this could be so cool, you just need to fund it. Um, it's a very different type of writing than it is to write about something you've already done. I, and I think you meant writing a paper. I oh, think. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So writing a, a, a manuscript to me is, is writing about past events, whereas this is writing about the future. Yeah. Um, so uh, it also means that it, it can hurt a bit more if you put your dreams out there and have them crushed and review, but you know, that's all right, that, that's part of the game. Um, so, uh, oh, the only other thing I wanted to show in this, um, in the, the document that I had up earlier, hold on. Uh, yes. as, as Chris is pulling that up, you know, regarding success rates, um, you know, if you're gonna go to a career academia, you know, you've gotta get used to some rejection. 
And what I've, at least my experience is, you know, when you're, when you're on a panel, maybe 25% of them just aren't good. And that's usually because the people just didn't put the time into really thinking about what they're doing. They just threw it in. You know, it was probably last minute. They probably thought, what the heck? I'm just going to throw it in. <laughs> I'm going up for promotion. I need to show I submitted more proposals or something. And they didn't really put a credible effort into it. Um, the other 75%, they're generally, they're generally okay. You know, the the flaws are are you know, it's, it's not really the idea so much. The ideas are generally pretty good, some better than others, you know, some more important than others. Um, but, uh, you know, what differentiates is, is a lot of times those little details and then the broader impact section. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess I, I, I raised that issue. There's only so much money, you know, it's 10 to 20% get funded. And I think a lot of faculty, when they get rejected, they think it's a, it's, it's a real, uh, uh, I mean, it hurts the ego a little bit, um, but you got to keep in mind and they take it personally, but you know, it, it was probably a good proposal. People probably liked it. It's just, it wasn't a 10% yeah. proposal. Um, it's really tight right now. Yeah. So you really, you really have to keep that in mind. A rejection doesn't mean that your idea wasn't worth anything. It just means that there were a lot of proposals submitted and a few of them did it a little better than you. So yeah. keep trying. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the 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 it's really tight right now. Um, and unlike NIH, which has um, a standing study section of the same people coming back over and over again, reviewers change on every panel. And so, what what can be a little dangerous, um, you know, we're, we're not quite talking about review yet, but what can be dangerous is to follow um, to to follow reviews. So when you get reviews back, some of them will be clearly fundamental and some of them will be sort of out there you can't chase them all you can't you know you can't early on i was trying to okay well they reviewer two said this i should definitely put this in there but you're going to get a whole different set of reviewers next time so chasing every nuanced review is, is kind of a waste of time you really need to step back and see what what's actually really quite important um i see someone come in the chat uh okay um, so I, you know, again, when it comes to evaluating the, the reviews, um, just bear that in mind as you go through this. Uh, okay, so oh, what I wanted, so I just wanted to point out that, you know, so if you look at this, the, the proposal itself is 15 pages, but you can see this document, it's 111 pages. Okay, so these proposals are so much more than just the actual proposal itself. There's a bio sketch that you've got to include. Um, again, the said three PIs. So there's a whole budget piece of it, which is you know uh, extensive, especially when you have multiple budgets. There's the budget justification, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then there's all these additional documents, right? That um, that you end up having to put together. Um, and so I just want to underscore that because it's it's so important when you're when you go to submit these proposals that there's so many other documents you're not surprised by because i've seen so many you know really poorly put together say data management plans because clearly someone got the proposal and then we're like oh right data management plan uh i'll do this and you know it every one of these documents needs to be considered to a certain extent you need to leave time uh to do that so there's just you know there's a whole bunch of additional documents that go with this. So there's a facilities documents here to demonstrate that you actually had the facilities available to do the work. There's, you know, over and over again, there's a whole bunch of different stuff. So I just wanted to make that point there. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing that if I can figure out, there we go. Okay, um, so are there, are there questions on the proposal before we kind of push forward a little bit here? Um, and, and sort of a proposal aesthetic and, and sort of how that's put together. I'm glad we've been so crystal clear that there's no questions. That's great. Uh, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so um, 
the prior work section uh, or, or the prior grant section seems to be pretty uh, significant uh, for for the for the reviewers, given that uh, what they are capable of um, uh, in in their in their early careers. So I was wondering, um, from a reviewer perspective, uh, how hard it is for uh, for a young proposal writer or or who is in early career to get a, 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 a proposal granted. Yeah, so uh, if you haven't had uh, funding, federal funding before, then you don't actually need to include that section. You can just put under prior, you know, no prior uh, NSF funding, which is totally legit. Um, I would say that NSF, um, to be totally honest, NSF very much unlike NIH, but NSF has a soft spot for new PIs. Um, and they, um, so, every program officer has a portfolio of proposals that they are handling. Those portfolios need to be balanced across several different uh, metrics. Uh, it includes university type, so, or college type, you know, you may have small colleges, large universities. It includes, I know, uh, it includes geographic uh, distribution. It includes um, gender distribution all sorts of different things that they have to balance their portfolio across. And it's also career stage. So you can't, uh, an individual program officer uh, shouldn't be handling uh, all uh, proposals from you know, full professors, for instance. So again, th there's a lot of different ways that they balance a portfolio. And what um, NSF does is that those panels are recommendations to the program officer. They're not Again, unlike NIH and unlike USDA, you are not ranking a proposal by number. You're ranking a proposal based on broad categories of, do you think it's fundable? The program officers then go back, uh, take that, those, that advice from uh, the panel and then make their decisions on who gets funded based on the metrics that they have to, to deal with as well. So um, uh, let's see. Oh, hopefully that helped. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read the... Um... Yes, thank you. Sorry, I forgot to close the, the kid gate. Now all my animals are streaming in here, so... Um, we'll I have a quick question, if, if you have a second. Um, when, when you're considering like a single PI versus a multiple PI proposal, at what point do you typically realize you need to bring someone else in? And like, what are the disadvantages and advantages of doing that? Absolutely. Uh, so from my perspective, I, um, I like to have a mix in my sort of scope of work. So um, you need to, so it's good to have a couple individual awards. Um, I think the, any time that I've looked to do uh, broader awards, it's for two reasons. One is that I have an idea, but I need someone else to make it like that much better. Um, you know, you need to think about, okay, is adding someone else going to make it 5% better, 20% better, what, you know, and make that sort of calculus. If it's only 5%, eh, it's probably not worth it. Um, if it's, you know, significant, you know, I can do this piece, they can do this piece together, it's going to rock, then that's a different story. Um, the other thing with, with proposals, multi-PI proposals, is that there are mechanisms at NSF which require you, know, you can't do as a single PI. And so there are projects that, you know, you need multiple PIs, often multiple institutions. Uh, there are EPSCOR mechanisms that, anyways, there's a whole bunch of mechanisms which um, you need multiple institutions or multiple PIs. So that, that's another, if you wanna go for some of those larger chunks of money that are multiple PI proposals, then you need to, need to play nice. I'm sure Jeff has some thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, I'll just add a little bit to it. Um... You know, uh, Chris and I mentioned, you know, writing proposals, you know, it's, it's a fun part of our job, right? You get to be creative, you get to do what you want. It's, there, there have certainly been proposals, maybe half the proposals I've written, I wrote them collaboratively because I wanted to work with that person. I like that person, they do good stuff. So it wasn't like, I have an idea, who can fit into my idea? It was, hey, I, I kind of like this area. Why don't we talk and figure out a good idea for a proposal? And so it kind of starts from the get-go as a collaborative project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, 
I, I when I, you know, when writing a proposal, you're, you're not really writing the proposal you want. You're writing the proposal that reviewers want to see. And after a while, it becomes the same thing, right? Because what you want is to get funded. And to do that, you write the proposal the reviewer wants to see, right? So you have to kind of, at, at some, if, if you have some weird, weird kind of things you like to do, but they're just not working, at some point, you just have to say, you know what, I'm just going to have to conform, you know, and, 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 uh, and change the way I approach this. Um, so regarding collaborators, you know, you might think, you know, I think I can do this, but I'm not sure that the review panel is going to be convinced I can do this. So this is a very pragmatic kind of cutthroat approach to finding a collaborator. It's like, I need a collaborator because I don't think I can convince the review panel. I need to bring some street cred to this one aspect of the project. Um, you know, of course you go into it, you know, professionally, et cetera. I mean, it, it's, it's a professional relationship, but it kind of starts from a place of, yeah, this isn't going to be competitive without one. I got to find a collaborator. And that can work two ways. It can either be a collaborative proposal or it can be a proposal with a subcontract to someone to do something specific. And those are two different things. A collaborative proposal um, is where you have basically two different budgets that go to two different institutions or, or three or four or whatever um, that go to those different institutions. Each person is responsible for their own budget. Um, a subcontract is, okay, this person is responsible for X deliverable and I'm going to pay them out of my budget and my institution is going to be responsible for the overall, but we're going to subcontract out a piece of money for this particular thing. So again, it, it, if, if you're, like Jeff said, if you, if you need some sort of cred for a particular piece of it, but it doesn't, it, it's not sort of an umbrella piece, but it's something very specific, you could do a subcontract for someone to help with that one thing. Yeah, and it can be collaborative without having multiple PIs too. Also true. You, know, you can have senior personnel who are collaborators, you know, so they, they, they maybe weren't involved in the original, you know, conception of the idea, uh, most of the intellectual merit, but they provide an important function for you to, to accomplish one of the aims, for instance, then you can bring them in that way. Too. Yeah, for sure. So th there's a lot of different ways to go about it, but um, again, it, it sort of depends on what your goal is. That help? Okay. All right, other questions? That kind of thing? Um, so in terms of, there's a question about whether it depends on whether you're coming from a small or large university and whether that makes a difference. Um, it's entirely what you're proposing. Uh, so it so I don't, I don't think it's going to make a difference if you fit the proposal to what you can conceivably do, then no, I don't think it does make a difference. If you are at an undergraduate only institution and your, you know, your, your aims are something that really need more resources than you have available, then yes, that's going to be. I, I wanted to just add to this. So this is a really, I'm glad, I'm so glad, Monica, um, you asked this question because it touches upon something called implicit bias. Now, when you go to serve on an NSF panel, um, you know, they spend a half an hour, well, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes of, of the morning of the first day of the panel talking about implicit bias. So basically to specific to your question, you should not discriminate between proposals because one is from a big university and one is from a small. You should simply be basing it on the quality of the proposal and the ideas put forward in the same way, right? You shouldn't, you know, if, if, if there's a Nobel laureate, I have such a funny, funny story about that, but let's say there's a Nobel laureate, right? And, and then a, a junior faculty member, right? You're not supposed to, oh, well, geez, they've done great work and, and this proposal might not be excellent, but they, they have a career of great work. So you shouldn't, shouldn't give them an edge, right? And implicit means that it's inherent to all of us. We have to consciously think about this, you know, because if you get a proposal, you know, from MIT versus, you know, the University of Southern Idaho, nothing against that, you know, I don't think there is a University of Southern Idaho, but you get what I'm going, you know, you, you might be inclined to say, well, Jesus, they really know what they're doing up at MIT. And so when you start reading that proposal, you know, you, you, you might already be biased to look more favorably at that proposal than the other one. 
you have to actually be very conscious about that and, and, and try not to, um, to let that kind of interfere with it. Mm -hmm. I have a class, I have a great example. So very quickly. So I was on a, uh, I had an NSF Discovery Corps postdoc fellowship and I was on a review panel and <laughs> I was reading these proposals and I didn't recognize the name, just like the class, I, like I wasn't, I didn't have this implicit bias because I didn't know who these people were. And there was this one proposal I was leading and I was introducing it and I said, well, you know, I just, I'm not so sure. Some of it was interesting, but it just didn't quite do it for me. And the rest of the panel, I was a postdoc, the only postdoc on the panel. They were kind of sitting there chuckling a little bit. And, and the program manager says, well, yeah, I see what you're saying. And she said, but man, it would be really cool to have a Nobel laureate as a Discovery Core. They had a senior fellowship, right, for established faculty. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> He ended up did get he, he did get the award and it was it, it turned into be a great project but uh, you know it's kind of funny yeah I I have to say that I've I've reviewed a couple proposals from very big players in several fields and I've uh, one thing I've noticed is that they they tend to write a proposal which I've dubbed the trust me proposal it's like you know it, it's really it's pretty vague and it's like but look what I've done and. Uh, in the panels that I've been on, that never flies. I've uh, those have actually been trashed pretty hard, um, despite the long record and very, you know, very prominent record of of these individuals. So, my experience too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so I, at least at at NSF, to me, I find that proposals are really judged individually. Excuse me. Uh, um, I really judge individually based on the what's being proposed and not a lot of that other stuff doesn't tend to get pulled into it. Mm -hmm. uh, so NIH, different story. Um, very okay. But yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've, yeah, I've served on uh, NSF panels in two different um, uh, two very different panels on in well I've served on three different panels um, in bio multiple times and then uh, two different NIH panels um, and and an ERC panel as well and so you get a feel for these different institutions and how they roll and I, I definitely find the NSF is um, at least as far as I can tell from these other um, panels I've been on very focused on the project All right, uh, are there other questions? No, okay. Um, so I was gonna briefly describe how a panel works before we get into the budget, just can, so that we can stay on time here. Um, and so when you submit a, a proposal, uh, I mentioned earlier, there's two types of reviewers, your ad hoc reviewers who are submitting an individual proposal, in, uh, sorry, uh, individual review in. Um, and then the panelists and the panelists um, will all meet in an individual, you know, come to a room, sit down and every, every proposal has been read by three people in the room and almost exclusively only three people in the room because everyone else has got their proposal. Sorry, I need to get rid of my cat. Go on, go on, go on. Okay. Now we have a dog. All right, hold on. Okay. All right. Uh, Jeff, do you want to uh, step in for one sec? Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead and do your thing. Um, yeah, so well, I guess let me just pause here and, and let's see if there's any more questions to relate it related to anything we've been discussing so far. There's some good stuff going on in the chat. I have a couple of my students on this call. I might pick on them. No questions? Right. Sorry, that was my. I, I was kind of hoping Chris was going to pick the cat up and have the cat join us. Uh, <laughs> no. I would have gone and got mine. You know, that was allowed. <laughs> um, the cat has something to say. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but so okay, so as far as the panels constructed, everyone's read, or every proposal has been read by three people, and those people all weigh in on the proposal in turn. There's a primary reviewer, a secondary reviewer, and a tertiary reviewer. Secondary reviewers usually responsible for starting the project, uh, the panels, uh, sorry, the panel summary for the review. Um, that's sort of neither here nor there right now. But um, so every project, there's probably 30, I don't know, 30 ish people in the room. Um, and everyone 
you know, has read a small portion of these projects. And so all of them are being ranked relative to one another, even though no one in the room's read all of them. Okay, so it, it's, a, it's a process. Um, and what's really important is that you get at least one of those people who've read your proposal that are in the room to champion your proposal. Because there are so many proposals and the, the funding line is so tight that if you don't have someone who's willing to go to the mat for your proposal, it's, it's just gonna be a meh all around and then you, it's not gonna get funded. It's not gonna get into that top 20% to be competitive for funding. Um, so it, it's really, it, it, it's a very stochastic process because sometimes people will, um, you know, you may get someone on that panel who really likes your idea and will push for it. And another, you know, another panel, you might not have that person. So it, it, it's a challenge um, to write in. It, that's sort of why we end up submitting proposals multiple times to different agencies, to, you know, because you really, it's, it's very difficult to consistently nail it. And, you know, I would say that my personal success rate is somewhat close to the sort of global success rate where 20% is probably about right in terms of proposals I've submitted overall. I don't know if Jeff may be more successful, but um, it's, it's, it's tough out there. I got spoiled the first four or five years I was at URI. I think I was at about a 40 to 45% success rate on things. You know, I don't know. I just found a, I, you know, you, you got to be kind of strategic about, yeah. you know, the topic, the topic will be the topic. It's your interest, but you can be kind of strategic about where you send it. You know, sometimes a proposal could fit well in two or three different programs. So then you got to think about, <clears throat> well, who's the program officer? You know, do I, do I know anything about the review panel? Would they appreciate something like this? So it's, so let's say it's thermodynamics, right? Your proposal is thermodynamics and biological systems. I could send it to a thermodynamics uh, program or I could send it to a biological systems program. Which one of those two, it could fit in either, which one of those two would appreciate it the most, yeah. right? And sometimes, you know, if it's mostly, if it's, you know, 55% thermo, 45% bio, sometimes that bio program might like it more because it brings in kind of a new way of looking at that field. And sometimes you can get things co-funded. I've had things funded by two different, two different panels. That, so that's a double-edged sword because then it gets reviewed by two panels. And if one panel loves it and the other one hates it, it may not get funded. But if both are just at the right level, then you can actually get things co-funded. But there's nothing worse than getting nine reviews back for a proposal because inevitably some of them are going to be brutal. But anyways. Um, okay, so reviews, uh, uh, panels work in a, it's a very sort of dynamic system. Uh, everyone's, and you, your, your uh, proposal probably is going to get about 10 minutes of discussion time max because there's 200 of them to get through in two and a half days. Um, so it, it's, a, it's actually a pretty grueling thing to go through as a reviewer because it's just constant like, uh, constant, like, okay, how about this one? How about this one? How about this one? But, um, but in the end, you know, you're going to spend a couple, you know, a couple months writing this proposal up and it's going to get about 10 minutes of time on the floor. Um, and that's, you know, it, you, that's why I said it really requires someone to be excited about it, to push that, push that forward. And as I've, as I've mentioned in my class before, you know, if you submit a proposal and it doesn't get funded, um, or you know, gets a decent score, but doesn't get funded, and you submit it a second time, uh, and it gets funded, then that was totally the work that you did to change it. If you submit it a second time and it gets a worse score, it's because that panel was dumb, right? It's always it's it's a stochastic process, but we always tend to interpret it depending on uh, you know our own sensibilities. So um, it just sometimes it just it, it's always in competition with the other. Um, projects on panel and uh, it can be, um, yeah, it, it can be a challenge. All right. Um, so, okay. Are there any questions on panel before I move on? I'm just looking at the time before I move on to budget. I know I didn't do a very good job explaining panel, but we'll cram for time here. No questions. All right. Okay, um, let's, uh, let's go to the budget real quick. 
Um, okay, so I'm gonna share, let's see. I'm gonna share my budget template, which is this one. Okay. Um, so you should, uh, everyone should have this um, budget template here. Uh, and what uh, a couple of things. So every budget's going to kind of fit into every NSF budget basically fits into this template. Um, the categories uh, are essentially people, then um, travel, other costs, and tuition. Those are, uh, I guess, there's also a um, sorry, uh, um, equipment category. Uh, there, are, every category works slightly differently, um, and your biggest category is always gonna be the people, okay? That's, uh, I mean, almost always, unless you're writing an instrumentation grant or something like that. Um, and so the way this is set up, um, I've, I've set this up for four years only because I'm currently working on a four-year project. So I just stripped the values, but um, the way the budget template is set up. So um, you have the salaries for people. So let's just say, okay, base salary for the PI, say 90,000-ish. Um, okay, so for as a PI, you get something called summer salary. Um, this is uh, a way to uh, increase your salary uh, during the summer months um, and basically contract your time. So you, we are paid for nine months. It's prorated over the year. So you get the same paycheck every, um, every month but we're actually only contracted for nine months of time. So we have three months of like free agent time where you can recontract that time out to federal uh, granting agencies. Uh, so if you take your base salary and divide it by nine, because that's your nine months, um, then that gives you your, um, your sort of monthly. And so your summer, in this case, summer, uh, summer would be a possibility of 30. Now, what NSF does is NSF will really only fund one summer month per project at this point. Um, you can, uh, I, I've tried in the past to, you know, oh, how about six weeks? No, they'll, they'll knock the budget back to uh, basically one month per project. So in this case, if you had say a $90,000 base salary, um, your potential summer salary would be 30, that would give you 10,000 per year, okay? So one month per summer. Um, now this this spreadsheet calculates in um, uh, it's a two percent raise or something like that per uh, it looks like two point five. Um, now same same goes for research tech. So say your research tech makes forty five thousand. Okay, so you see that these values pop in um, in terms of oh, that's their calendar. So we got to do twelve months. Their calendar. Uh, okay, I'm not sure why it's doing that. Okay. Um, oh, that's why, because I didn't add another zero. Because, okay, there we go. Um, so this would be the calendar months, so 12. Um, okay, and again, so you have your salary, then um, the 2.5% uh, raise throughout. Now, what you'll notice is that the research tech, the, the benefits, so when I put in a value here, it added a value here as well. And this is uh, your fringe benefits. This is healthcare, everything like that. Um, in this case, uh, I'm budgeting for an individual um, because it's individual healthcare. Uh, if I were budgeting for family healthcare because I didn't know who I was going to hire or if I had a technician who um, was on uh, or was, uh, was the primary healthcare provider for the family. Uh, what is it now, Jeff? Is it 82%? I think it's 82. Yeah, it's a lot higher. <laughs> 82%. Yeah. Right. So you can see how very quickly a $45,000 salary puts you, you know, pretty high on your budget pretty quickly. Um, and then that's going to end up also um, getting indirect costs added to it. So I, I've given you this template to kind of play around with um, and kind of take a look at. Um, it appears as though it's not. Oh, summarizing very well. Oh, I'm not sure why, but um, so the other categories here are travel. Um, so you have foreign and domestic travel. Uh, say you want to go to a conference. 
Um, you kind of have to be a little careful with this travel category because uh, the reality is that if you want to if you want to go to a, uh, a, a foreign conference, um, you're pretty much not going anywhere for less than two thousand um, it, dollars. It's just travel costs and everything. By the time you factor in hotel registration for all that kind of stuff, but um, you know, but it can also be viewed as padding the budget a little bit if you go too crazy on this. So. Um, you know, say you want a budget for you and a graduate student to go to a conference in, well, probably not a foreign conference in year one, but anyways, you get the idea. Um, and maybe a domestic conference. Okay, so that adds up over, over time. Uh, we've got tuition, um, which I actually happen to have the numbers here. It's 14096 right now. Um, So you begin to fill this in um, and what's going to happen is you'll see uh, as if this was working properly and the sum was actually working properly. Oh, we haven't put a grad student in, I think that's why. Grad student academic year is 20, 20. Hey Chris, your 90,000 in your PI is 90 comma zero zero instead of 90,000. Good point. It's uh, there we go. Ah, that's that's fixing some of the values. Thank you. That's why we have uh, budgetary people go over this and not not me do it myself. Um, all right. So that yeah, that clears up. So you can see pretty quickly that um, you know, you add in. So I've got a research technician. I've got a graduate student. I've got tuition for the grad students and travel, and we're already at over two hundred thousand dollars just before we haven't had it added in any materials um any you know any any research at all activity yet no publishing fees or anything like that and you know you can as you begin to put this budget together you need to remind yourself that the average uh nsf award per year is about 120. okay so I, what I did want to do as an exercise was to have people kind of put a budget together um, and take a look at where, you know, if you want to put your dream budget together where you have, this could be a technician or it could be a postdoc. Um, you could have a graduate student. We got to pay them over the summer too. So we're going to add in uh, 12,000 for the summer. Again, start putting together a budget and start looking at where you end up with that budget. Um, and Okay, so we should probably, you know, do some science here. Let's say we're going to do 10,000 in material costs for that first year. Um, and so you start adding it all up and then figure out where you get to. And then we have to go through. So my personal, the way I typically budget is I will budget for what I want. And then I'm going to start cutting the back, back the budget to be more reasonable for what I think will actually get funded. Um, and that's a, that's a challenging process because as you can see in year one, we're already at 240, right? Um, and, you know, we're 10,000 for a yearly research budget, at least for the consumables and things that we do is pretty low. Um, that would be, that would probably cover our consumables, but not a lot of our other research costs. So, you know, you can very quickly get to 250 a year without, without much trouble. And that's going to be a little a little high if you want to go to NSF with that that type of proposal. So what are we cutting? You know, what do you cut out? Um, and so that's that's a tricky process, and it's even trickier when it comes to uh, if you're going to start making collaborative proposals. Um, I've definitely had the experience where we had a collaborative proposal that had a, a total max budget of three million. And there were five PIs, and when everyone submitted their budget, we were at about nine million. It's like, well, all right, <laughs> we're gonna have to cut. Um, and you know, that's it's a process of trying to get everyone to kind of reduce their budget. And in the end, it is it's it's tight. And so you know, if you as you know, PIs as managers of these proposals. The, the funds on these are often very, very tight and very, um, 
you know, uh, there's, there's a lot that goes into these projects and the people cost a lot. And that's, you know, that's how these projects go. I don't know, Jeff, what, what your, at least in, I'm thinking about it from bio. I don't know whether engineering has slightly uh, higher typical funding rates, but. Typically for a single PI, um, it's a little lower. Oh, okay. We're usually uh, at anywhere from 100 to 120 or 130K in total, total yeah. direct plus indirect per year for our awards. Um, yeah, yeah. So this, sorry, I didn't talk about indirect. So this is calculating both here. Um, yeah. So we have a, a indirect rate of 57.5%. And so what, what we're totaling here is the total what are called direct costs, which are the costs that you actually, the money you actually have to spend. Um, and there's a couple uh, categories of the budget which are, um, are exempt from the indirect costs that includes tuition and equipment. Um, but so that's the money you have to spend right here. That's the, the, well, sorry, this is the total direct. This is the modified direct, which is that minus the tuition. And then this is what the money that goes to the university for keeping the lights on and keeping the internet going and that kind of stuff. So yeah. your total here at the bottom is a combination of your total direct costs plus the money that goes to the university for housing you, right? So that's the direct and then the indirect costs. Um, and then that's the, the total for the year. Yeah, I think I've, my, my experience, you know, in engineering, um, I, you have to keep the, you have to take a look at what's been awarded for a program because that'll give you an idea of, uh, of how much is a reasonable request. But ultimately you have to ask for what you need. Right. And I've started, uh, when I first got there, we talked about mentoring and how to find out about this stuff when you're an early career, you know, junior faculty member. Um, I, you know, I was told 100K a year, direct plus indirect, 100K a year, that's the norm. Try to stick to that. And I stuck to that for a while and then I started going on review panels and I'm like, well, hold on a minute. They're asking anywhere from 300K total to 400, 450, 500K. And the program officers aren't that concerned with it. So, you know, you do have some wiggle room. Ultimately, you need to be credible, right? You can't offer the world and then only 100K a year. You know, the budget has to fall in line with the scope of, of what you're doing. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, you kind of work through one of these budgets and um, the reality is you're always going to, you're, you're always going to find that you, you need to knock the budget back, right, from what you actually want. Um, and again, you know, you do have to ask for what will, what makes the project feasible. But if they're, you know, if the program officers are looking at two projects that, you know, are going to provide uh, solid science and one of them is three hundred thousand dollars more than the other uh, you know that 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 is going to weigh in um, so that that actually should not be a uh, review criterion I mean it's typically not something remarked upon unless the budget is is really excessive um, by the reviewers but it does come into play when it comes to the program officers and I've also had, you know, program officer say, hey, we want to fund you. And you're like, yay, but minus 10%. And you know, oh, you know so there, there's that, you know, you can also get something awarded, but then under, you know, X amount of budget as opposed to what you asked for. So you've got to come back with a revised budget and a description of how, how that changes anything. So th there's a couple of ways to kind of make that work. Um, what was the other piece I wanted to bring up here? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think it's anytime you're working with um, research budgets, you just have to be realistic about what you can do for a certain amount of money, um, what is you know feasible for that project, um, and then what is you know what is within the realm of what they will fund and. It's also true that, you know, especially for single PI awards, uh, in your first grant or two, your, you know, total ceiling of what you can ask for is definitely going to be lower than someone who's been at this for a while has a track record of, of funding and success. So NSF does really like to fund junior PIs, but they're not going to hand you over a huge chunk of money 
right off the bat. The one exception to that, I think, would be the career awards, which um, are a pretty decent chunk of money for five years um, that are directed at uh, early career researchers. But those are um, those have other criteria involved that make them a little more complex. Um, okay, are there questions about the the budget side of things here? Looks like there are a couple of questions in the chat. Oh, sorry. And um, when I'm sharing, it's hard to see the chat. Oh, so one was about, is it common to request your full salary in a proposal? Most example budgets I've seen only request partial salary. Yeah, so in this case, um, the putting the salary here is only, um, it, it's just a, so that, that's just giving you the total salary. But again, your only your your request here is only ten thousand, so you're only asking for ten thousand a year. So um, there are what are called soft money institutions where you do have to make up a vast majority of your salary from federal funds, um, and those have slightly different rules at NSF. They treat them differently than a proposal where you're just asking for a month of summer salary. In that case, you would just be asking for that one month, which is uh, here the the ten. Um, no, so the next question was, um, the sorry, do you have to be hired as faculty at a university prior to submitting? No. Um, so you, I have had, um, postdocs as co-PIs on proposals before. Um, and again, you know, the, in that case, we were asking for their full salary because they were at the postdoc level, but would you, you know, if you have been hired somewhere and you're proposing, um, before you get there, and actually I, I did this as well, you just need your salary figure and then you can put that in. But um, again, this is, it's flexible. So you could put in for um, money as a postdoc um, now and that if you get hired somewhere, you can modify your budget accordingly to, to how that kind of, uh, your, your positional change affects um, the overall budget. Um, okay. Are there other questions? I think this, the second piece of that one, Chris, was, um, and maybe, maybe you addressed it, was, uh, you know, if you get an award, can you take it with you if you go to a new university? Yes. In general, you can, especially if it's like a single PI. If it's a big collaborative award um, where other people at the university could do the work or that you're one of, maybe you're the PI or a co-PI and there's three other people at URI, for instance, um, you might have to negotiate something and receive a sub award for your component of that project or, um, and, and NSF encourages that, right? They, they invested in the idea with, with the PI or the PIs, you know, so they, they want to see those funds transfer institutions. Yeah, the only, the only exception I can think of to that would be if it was awarded with EPSCOR funds and you were moving to a state that was not EPSCOR, that would get a little dicey, but yeah, yeah. It, it, that's a, that's a, that's sort of a, a niche problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, sorry. Yeah, so Tricia, I think the 90K, so that's not, um, if you're a postdoc, you can request your full salary. Right. or a grad student but uh, in this case if you're if you're kind of asking about that number they require that you include your base and then you take a percentage of that so it's not common for faculty do not include um full salary request yeah unless you're at a soft money institution yeah, yeah. Unless you're soft money. um so this uh other question you know some some larger groups yeah so i i think um if if you want to run a large group it's very difficult to do that strictly, uh, strictly on NSF funds. I have to say, I think because two things here: one, the NSF awards aren't aren't enormous. I mean, they can be decent size, but they're not always. You're not going to fund a group of ten people for sure. Um, but also, NSF doesn't award too many awards to an individual, generally speaking. Um, so, you know, if you start having two, three NSF awards, chances that you're going to get a fourth pretty slim that's again very different from nih which is more than happy to pile r1s on people if they're being productive um the the other aspect of that is so many of us um don't just apply to nsf i uh you know my lab has gotten money over the years from i think five different eight 
five or six different agencies. Um, and so you really need to, if you want to run a, a group that's, um, you know, has a bunch of people and, you know, you've got some support, you really need to tile funding in ways that allow you to go to different institute, uh, different, you know, federal agencies, government agencies, uh, maybe local agencies, maybe NGOs, foundations, um, because otherwise it just, it, it's too tough to go to one single panel or one single agency and just assume that you're going to continue to have regular funding. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, if, you, if you think about the tuition and, and uh, it, you know, this is the best way to spend money in my opinion, but it can be a lot of money. You think about the stipend and tuition for a graduate student, and then you, you take into account fringe benefits and, um, and then overhead, you know, it can be 70 K a year. And then if you also want to build in materials and supplies money and funds for travel to conferences and maybe publication costs and a little bit of summer salary, it's really you should plan on about 100K per year per grad student. Yeah. Um, now, so that for, for, for a group of 10 grad students, if it was solely grant funded, you're talking a million dollars a year in research that you're pulling in. Now, um, none of us really operate <laughs> that way. You know, there's, that's why, you know, students will do TAs for a period of time, right? right? Um, or, you know, we mix funding mechanisms from different sources or we're, you know, we're working with uh, grad students to, to write fellowships or, you know, scholarships and things like that. It's so that, you know, a faculty can maintain the, the types of groups that they want to, you know, because it's all about providing that, that, that culture for being productive and doing great work. Right in your lab group. Yeah. Uh, whether this database for common agencies, I mean, I, I think that that's certainly. I mean, you could talk to the research office, but I mean, there are a few sort of federal agencies that are pretty standard: NSF, NIH, USDA. Um, uh, there's another uh, Department of Defense. If you're sort of on the engineering side. Um, and, you know, those are kind of where people tend to have a base and then you can kind of branch out from there. Um, and, and a lot of that really depends on what you're doing. So for instance, um, my lab has gotten a couple of grants from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. The only reason we've done that is because they have one of their sort of groups has gone in a, a marine microbe direction and we've tried to take advantage of that. They have a symbiosis um, program right now, which we're taking advantage of. But if they weren't in that area, then we wouldn't have any way to get money, money from them. So it really depends on being opportunistic, um, depending on what different funding agencies are looking to fund. Okay. Um, so we've, we've pretty much hit our time. Um, I'm, again, I'm more than happy to hang around and answer questions for a little bit, but I understand if people have things planned um, and need to uh, head off and do other things as well. I'm gonna stop screen sharing my budget there. Hey Chris, so if you have students that are getting like GRFP proposals and stuff, does that go into the prior funding section that we were talking about as well, or is that considered outside the scope of the research? No, so the, those awards go to the students. And so the, that's not, um, uh, that I wouldn't include on my current and pending because it's not, it's not going to me. Um, as a student, if you are, have a GRFP and then later apply to NSF, um, I don't know whether they put, Jeff, do you know that whether you'd put that under your current or sorry your, pre, your previous awards? If you, were, I, I think I I'm tend to say no, but I'm not positive. Yeah, I I would I would bet it's not required. Right. Um. But if you but if you were able to make you know to accomplish quite a bit through it and it helps your case in a proposal, right. you then I would dedicate a little paragraph to it. Um, yeah, I think that would probably be up to you. Yeah, I so yeah. I, I think you know, general rule of thumb is that if there's something that isn't required that's going to help your case, put it in anyways. Okay. I'm so glad that my cat and dog fights can be recorded. 
for this. <laughs> it's a good one. But thank you both very much. It was it was really great. Uh, it was nice seeing you too, Chris. Yeah. See you later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris and Jeff. We really appreciate it.